Thank you. I think this is the 43rd annual uh, interdisciplinary lecture series sponsored by the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. The title of the series this year is Advocacy in Healthcare and Medicine. And Peter's going to introduce our speaker for uh, this week and the kickoff speaker for the series who we decided immediately upon choosing the, the topic that can we get Tom for uh, the very first uh, lecture? So we're really excited to have you, Tom. But before we get into that, I just want to thank a few people. So Dan Bruddy was also one of the committee members who put in a tremendous amount of work, and Lori Zoloff, who I did not see here. But um, Renana, Dean, Hudson Fritter, and Haley, did I see? Oh, Valerie. Sorry, Val. Sorry. Sorry, very bad. I apologize. My apologies. Oh, and here's Lori. So um, also put in a huge amount of work, So um, and Haley Beck. So I want to thank them. Um, we'll probably thank them again at the end of the year uh, for all the work that they put into this. And then I just want to say a few things. So no lecture next week. So we do not have a speaker next week, but in two weeks, we have Dr. Brian Williams. So some of you may know uh, Dr. Williams is a trauma surgeon here at UFC, but also a um, well-known author, um, ran for Congress, um, and a little bit of a, a teaser. We have some of his books um, in two weeks, so for those of you that show up. Um, if you'd like the series on your in calendar, your Outlook invite, please let Renan know. Please also distribute the series in your networks. Um, we have always had incredible attendance at this seminar and this series. I think the speakers this year are just fantastic. Like they're really nationally, internationally recognized experts in this content area. We think that they're gonna have just a, a variety of different opinions and a different, uh, different angles of looking at advocacy and healthcare. So advertise the series um, and you know, get people here. Um, last, you all found L168, <laughs> so tell your friends and colleagues who are for years, uh, you know, used to attend it in, uh, I don't know what the room number is, but yeah, Q117, that for this year, we're going to be in L168, unless we burst at the seams and or the AV uh, stuff never works, in which case we'll figure something else out, but um, thanks so much, uh, Peter, and thanks everyone for coming, so I'll let him, uh, Peter introduce Tom. Uh, thanks, Micah. So, um, uh, Probably uh, Tom Ginsburg needs no introduction for many of you, but for those of you who don't know Professor Ginsburg well, he is the Leo Spitz Distinguished Service Professor of International Law at the University of Chicago, where he serves as faculty director for the Forum on Free Inquiry and Expression, as well as the Malyi Center for the Study of International and Legal Integrity. He's also a research professor at the American Bar Foundation. Um, professor Ginsburg has a BA, JD, and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, currently co-directs the Comparative Constitutions Project, a National Science Foundation-funded data set cataloging the world's constitution since 1789. Um, he is the author of multiple award-winning books, um, and I will just uh, mention a few of them uh, from 2021, Democracies and International Law, from 2018, How to, Sur How to Save a Constitutional Democracy, from 2015, Judicial Reputation and Comparative Theory, from 2009, The Endurance of National Constitutions. Um, the list goes on and on. It's really, really impressive. Um, and um, he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, so I won't go through all of his CV because we wouldn't have time for his talk, um, but really is an honor uh, for uh, us to welcome uh, Professor Ginsburg to kick off this lecture series. So Tom, thank you. Thanks, Peter. And um... Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I want to say one very quick thing before I get started about the, the Forum on Free Inquiry and Expression. You might have seen that we got this very large gift that was announced this week, which is uh, um, uh, really for all of us at the university. And so if you have ideas for things we ought to be doing, please send them along. We're, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we hope will be um, able to touch every corner of the university. So uh, my talk today is called Advocacy and Professionalism in Polarized Times. And I don't know if I can share it up on the screen. Did we work that out yet or not yet? That's okay if not. Okay, no problem. Well, hopefully they'll be coming. Okay, that's no problem at all. Let me, let me just uh, uh, close, move this thing so I can see my notes here. So um, 
I don't think it's a secret that we're in extraordinarily polarized times in the United States. Um, and there's so much evidence for this. Since 1960, there's been a consistent range of some presidential elections, whether it's Trump or Obama, and with every one of those until this, there's always been a point at which one candidate or the other got by a five or six years. Not evenly divided, never had that. Right now, according to 538.com, uh, according to their model, uh, Trump and Harrison win the election from. 58 or 60 out of the front. So it's very uncertain. Now that's good. It's a healthy sign in the democracy. You don't want um, parties to put up candidates who are you know, totally done. There's something good about political competition. Um, but what is interesting about our moment is just how far apart people are. So and there's so much evidence for this, right? Um, in the 1950s, they asked Americans about interracial marriage. Back in the 1950s, 1958, only 5% of Americans believe in racial. Now there's only 5% of people who disagree of racial. Really, probably 10% of people say yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, and that, it's a pretty convincing sign of a major social change. But now, um, only 5% of Americans, it's an extraordinarily low percentage, will be comfortable having their child marry someone who's got a political part. Now think about that. That's incredible. We are. We are, um, we operate in different different information universes, different political universes. And uh, the politicians, other evidence for this is Congress, where you look at, uh, it used to be the case that the rightmost Democrat would be the right of the left most of the constituencies. And now that's not true at all. There is total separation between the parties. So it looks much more like the United Kingdom or something like that, and you know, maybe people that's all of a sudden traditionally were. Um, so that's very disturbing. Um, and the other thing is the rise of what they call so so-called affective polarization. Affective polarization, the first word of science is given for a polarization in which it's basically the motive. We just hate the other side. Whatever they're for, we're against. Right. And whatever the you know, therefore, there is. And it's kind of what we are, political tribes, where the connection is emotional rather than rational, right? Because if, if we disagree on policy, then there's a hope for solving policy. Uh, but if we disagree just that the other side are, are evil, well, then it also leads to what we're seeing in American politics, the escalation of the terms of political commentary. Uh, to the point where people are even willing to overthrow or damage basic institutions like the courts and such, uh, the electoral process, because it's an existential issue. Of course. We could not possibly allow those guys to uh, stay uh, And we're going to see some you know, two political assassinations or something like that. Can you see this again? It's a very bad time, very polarized. There's some good news, which is when you look at uh, polls of Americans on issues. We are less divided than the leaders, than the politicians. The politicians don't have a record. Most Americans have consensus positions on a lot of issues, and basic gun freedom, on abortion. That's really a spirit. That's more of a consensus that there should be, um, uh, you know, some restrictions on abortion, but not, not total. Uh, and so, so there's actually a possibility. That's kind of optimistic. But the way our uh, House of Representatives, gerrymandered and such, politicians have incentives to outbid to each other. There's whole ecosystems of money which encourage this. And so um, our institutions aren't adequately representing us. It's a pretty dark moment. Um, now, if you think about it, you know, I think this is, you know, unpleasant. But when we look at American history, we do see other things. And one of them actually is the late 19th century. Late 19th century, uh, there's political assassinations, there's massive class conflict, there's gentle uh, institutions which essentially turn a major part of the United States into an autocracy, not a democracy. So, there are major challenges to things back then. And um, one thing I want to, you know, I think it's important to remember, is out of that period, we actually came a major period of reform in American history, the progressive era, right? Well, we got a major constitutional amendment passed, women are getting the right to vote, 
take the right to vote. Okay. Um, we have um, the rise of, you know, sort of helping professions and a lot of reform legislation, the Child Labor Act and things like this. And so that's 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 a really interesting and important thing. It should give you, I hope, a real hope. But we are not acting. And the fact that we actually agree as people, one of our politicians, is there might be some space for a realignment to produce in the era of reform. Now, relevant for my topic today, that period between about 1890 to 1920 is the period in which profession emerged, the rise of profession in the United States. And what are professions? Well, I mean, professions, professional consciousness, professional ideals came about really very much aligned with the progressive ideas about politics. What were the progressive ideas about politics? I'll tell you that. The progressives uh, were known for believing in science, believing in the ability of rational inquiry to solve problems, for a belief in democracy and ultimately this work in declaration. And um, as one of the phrases from the era went, um, there's no Democrat or Republican way to pay the street. Just a way to take a street. So what we want to do is find the people who know how to pay streets and give them the ability and resources to do that and keep the politics out of it. And so you see at the same time a rise of the administrative state. Relatively late in the United States compared to counterparts, but the administrative state rests on the idea of scientific and technocratic expertise insulated from the political politics. And um, that, that pursuit in, in good faith will lead to uh, the best social outcome. You find a technocrat, we give them the decision making power, and 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 we'll, we're off and running. It's also important to note that this is the rise of the period in which the University of Chicago works. So, the reason this is the fact that we're kind of known as the discretion university, the academic uh, freedom university, the place where we have the research and development. It's certainly an artifact of when we were founded. If we were founded when Harvard and Yale were founded, well, we wouldn't have their baggage. Which Maybe it's continuing to have as far as income, but I'm rebellious in the idea of in, in an era in which um, we thought that science could solve problems. And, uh, you know, when donors pushed to influence the program in the university, the first president was back and said, No, no, we're, we're not going to take issues, uh, positions on issues of the day. We're going to have free speech. And if this professor wants to pursue a communist research program, that's perfectly fine. That's not the universe. That's an individual professor and we can provide an environment to make that reform. Put their ideas forward because they're confident that in the in the exchange, those ideas will be tested. The bad ideas will fade away, the good ideas will be survive. A famous person in this regard is John Dewey, who was here at the University of Chicago during the founding era. And he left the founder of the American Association of University Professors. And that's another kind of vehicle, if you will, for professional plate. <laughs> The AAP is the body which, said, which purports to uh, put forward academic freedom as a professional norm for all of us to pursue our research without fear of interference. That means you can say, well, it turns out, and it says you can say crazy things on your Twitter account, you can get fired. Um, and I'll talk a little more about how this actually works. But just one point out that that is a professional. Here is my time. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, the, now the only thing I can't figure out is how to get that band off the top. Okay, but it's, it's no, no problem. There's a way to. Can I move it to the bottom? That, but yeah, actually, if you go here more and say hide floating menu controls. Oh, okay, there we go. Wow, fantastic! Thank you. All right, so. Um, of course, the other professions are nerves and mind, right? Uh, those are two examples. Um, law, medicine, accounting. It used to be that um, divinity would be seen uh, as a kind of profession. There's a professional uh, uh, expertise. And maybe I'll say a little bit about what a profession is before I go into it. What is it? What is it that distinguishes being a professional from being some field of knowledge. So basically, it's professions involve the application of specialized knowledge to particular jobs. Right? That definition. Of course, there are some fields in which that is taking place, which we don't consider profession. Plumbers, you know, farmers, and uh, you know, I know some 
in that same regard, well, you know, that's where most status is, and that's but that's an endogenous to the fact that we're a professional. When we get named as a profession, we get high status, we have a kind of deal with society, which is a lot of autonomy, a lot of self regulation. And, you know, why is that? Why don't we have the profession of honor? And the answer is that the standard economic economist answer might be familiar to you is that a profession is a field of knowledge practice in which you cannot tell the out tell the amount of effort expended by a person by a, by a professional uh, from what it happens. Right? So I go to one for treatment, you know, go in for surgery, and I I don't survive a lot of it. Well, you don't know, we don't. The observer can't tell if that's because of malpractice or because I'm in the body, right? Uh, you can't tell from the, the, the outcome what how much effort is put in unless you in fact have a specialized knowledge. So a layman cannot tell, right? That's a key feature. You can't tell if you one of you comes to me and says, represent me in court, and you lose the case. You don't know if that's because I was a bad lawyer or because you had that. So that kind of knowledge structure means that. Professions can make claims to be something. We are we are we are able, we must in fact regulate this. We couldn't possibly have laymen telling us what's good and bad medicine, and what's good and bad legal practice. We need to have that knowledge ourselves. And so it's basically a claim uh, deal with society where we as professions say, we're going to take care of ourselves. By the way, we're going to have a very much service orientation. That's one thing you often see with professions. We have the lawyers do our pro bono hours and such. And, the society thinks we're not just making money, you know, we are. You know, yeah. um, uh, and, and so there's kind of a, 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 a contract which we need to go and regulate ourselves. And we get a lot of funding and all right. So that, that, that idea, those claims also rise, and they're rooted in the same kind of technocratic ideas about knowledge uh, of the early 20th century. Now, um, all right, how do these two things fit together? Well, I want to first talk a little bit about um, democracy. So um, when I I'm going to move that, oh, great, right, thanks. Uh, <laughs> what's democracy? That's in one of the I call it an essentially contested concept because there's a million different definitions of it. But uh, to me, it comes down to you need you need to have elections. You need to have a certain number of rights which allow this election to proceed. You know, the basic right. And in my definition, my colleague here, he talked all about this idea of democracy. It's really important for you. Democracy. We need this kind of technocratic professional expertise in order for democracy to work. Let me explain why. You know, you go have an election. There are people who are counting the ballots. They are doing so on the basis of laws and rules that they have learned and they have professional knowledge of. And we expect them to follow those rules. We expect them to withstand pressures which are naturally there in a highly partisan and polarized time. To uh, shift things one way or the other, throw out that balance as you can at the edge. We are now in this facing huge challenges to these election monitors who are pounding on the doors of the folks who are being counted in one county in Michigan, uh, saying, We need to watch what you're doing. You know, if you're still in the election, then what were they, what were they doing? They were engaged in professional activity. You can't have a democracy without a trust that the people who are counting the votes are engaged in. And regulated by internalized protection. Beyond that, of course, I think that the administrative states is necessary for democracy. You know, all kinds of problems, and we want people to generate information. We want them to pursue policy uh, without partisan lines. You go into the driver's get you know, driver's license. You don't want that person asking if you're a Democrat or Republican before they give you the driver's license at the DMV. Um, we know that the administrative state is super powerful, so we want some political controls over it, and that's really complicated and messy. But the idea of mutual civil service is fundamental because if you didn't have mutual civil service, and many countries are like this, where the incoming president gets to hire and fire the entire national civil servant, those countries tend not to be one. Why? Because losing power means it's not just the president losing power, it's just the entire cadre. Thousands of people who depend on it, and it will never give up. So the idea that you can insulate politics from administration is, I think, consistent with what democracy is about. And it's a controversial idea. Um, you know, we have this idea, sometimes you'll hear the term around the neutrality. We are we have institutional neutrality. 
which means we do not speak out when there's issues of the day. And then the term neutrality in my telephones is always what generates a lot of, well, nothing is neutral. All right, I know nothing is neutral, but if we can distinguish between a university endorsing a uh, candidate for president, let's say, uh, from not doing so, right? And, and so that there's, um, even if the term is fundamental, there's something to that idea. Um, the, 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 uh, the philosopher says, you know, it's, a, it's an impossible but necessary that we can have practices which are pursued in the name of neutrality, impartiality. There's many, many words we could put in there, but I think you get the idea. There's something about the technocratic, uh, uh, um, pursuing the technocratic ends without uh, political so solutions. Now, this idea, of course, is under great attack. From the left end, uh, and the idea that there's no doubt, and there's people under that because there's no way the manga people thought they would be actually carrying out their job. They just didn't believe. And you got similar, I think, attacks from the left. Yeah. That there's no, no such thing as neutrality, and there's you know there's no neutral position. So we should we have to take over, and we have to impose our particular values on every political practice. Right. 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 The danger to the danger to democracy. In my um, so let me uh, go on and oh, I talked about that. Talk that. Oh yeah, I wanted to say one other thing about that about professions, which is it is amazing that technocratic knowledge persists even in serious dictatorships. I've read a lot on dictatorships. You know, in Putin's Russia, there's large swaths of information which the state is producing, which is accurate. This is true even in the Soviet Union. Why? Well, smart people went into the state administration because there's no realm of politics. Um, there was much information we do not trust, anything on the military, on the invasion, and on the casualties. That's being suppressed. But there's huge structures to produce accurate knowledge, even in severe data, which is just there's something valuable to the practice, that, and maybe something in which true knowledge practices sort of resist over politicization. They retain the form. Uh, there's something that's called it the semantic term here, uh, that the practitioner of some practices consistently, even in very, very fine. Now, let me talk about the English guy. I always like this quote. Uh, this, uh, this so, um, 1900, actually 1899, the university faculty adopts this set of positions, which we now know is uh, my great travel principles or travel theory. It's all really old. It's constitutional to the university that it will not take positions on issues of the day and that it will um, uh, provide the widest environment. So, Harper, when he was talking about this, also had occasion to talk about, you know, he's defending himself from donors who want professors fired. And he articulates a vision of academic freedom, which I think ultimately then feeds into the American Soviet University profession. He says, well, all right, so if you have a professor, um, and they do various things, they would be violating their professional privilege. What are they? Promulgate truth or ideas and opinions which are tested scientifically by colleagues. Proclaim uh, something as true when you don't get no, still unresolved. Doesn't mean I've put the feedback on the very interesting words. Takes advantage of classroom and exercise to probably partisan. Speaks about things which he has not known as professional knowledge, essentially. Talks about uh, things in which he has no experience, fails to exercise that quality, and this is a dig at our faculty, uh, which is, it must be confessed in some cases that the professors lack ordinarily called common sense. <laughs> so a professor who, doesn't, who exercises no common sense, can they be fired? And Harper says, no, no, they are abusing their professional privilege. They are not living up to the professional needs, but they are violating no confessional principle. They might be a bad teacher, but they can't be fired. And that becomes the basis of the academic freedom that we now know in the United States. We're debating now, especially like right now, when people are being fired for tweets. Uh, there was a professor fired from a liberal arts school for tweets about gossip. And she fired. It's the first time a tenured professor has been fired for something like that. Generally speaking, academia, we're really, really fragile. We do see that in dictators. It's pretty easy to override these professionals. And uh, so I think it's worthwhile to go back to this idea of what professional values are in our 
But I know it's been proper saying it's bad. You can't be part of the Twitter account in the United States. That's the American Association of University President's position. But he's implying that it's kind of bad. Like they say, that if you're talking about things you don't have any competence, not being as good at being a faculty member is good. And this is in the context in which, of course, we all have different men, but we can all speak freely. They're better and worse. The professional ethics is kind of an alternative mode of regulation, and it substitutes, in my view, for actual legal record. In this moment, when academia is, you know, well, university presidents being called before Congress and being fired thereafter, I think it's very important for us to go back to those professional norms of self-regulation to avoid what will, I don't know, I'm not sure, you know, it's very severe, but a new rules in legislation that will change fundamentally how we do what we do uh, because in some sense of perception it's the power lived up to our privilege. Just a side note on this. Does that mean you can do anything and not be part of it? No. If I go into my law class and I compare the to the law class and I start talking about medical ethics, of course, there's many reasons you wouldn't want to be doing that. I know we're talking about medical ethics, but you know, we're talking about engineering physics. Of course, I can do that. I'm not doing the job for which I was hired, or if I'm severely un incompetent, I can be fired. But we've developed a set of norms of content, the university is using the content in a way with regard to the way we go about teaching your class uh, within the scope of the disciplines become very important for that for policing what's in and out. All right. I say that because I think the, the problems are similar in academia as they are in other professions. Now here, what I want to do, see how we're doing. Yeah. I'm going to talk about a few cases and I'm very happy now to kind of switch into a discussion. Um, and so Jeff Thomas, so the question, the big question is, you know, you have said claims of professions to use knowledge and service to the society. You have internal rules which should regulate us. And that's part of our deal. We are saying to society, you couldn't possibly regulate us, only we know what we're doing. But we're going to do a good job ourselves. When someone engages in malpractice, we're going to have them fired. When someone um, engages in, uh, this is an interesting one in my field, participating or encouraging people to overthrow the U.S. the electoral uh, count, we're going to disbar them. It's really important for people to because in that context in particular, I was taking a side disclaimer. The rule of law is this grand ideal, but you know, it can't be that we rely on good people in office to keep the rule of law going. What the, what the rule of law is, is varmint us specifically, is when the president comes along and says, we're going to overthrow the democracy, here. we're not going to allow the electoral election to go forward. All the people around you uh, have to be doing a calculus in their head. Do I go along with this or not? And of course, in many, many countries, we're going along is what you do. Watch out, if you're not trying to be dominant, that we could go along with the coup. But that calculus is going to depend on what are going to be the consequences if I go along with this doesn't. And advising the president that he can legally do something he can might be to, the president's only going to be there for four more years from now. You have to think of that. So you've got to be weighing that power for four years versus if it doesn't work, I'm going to lose my law license and my ability to do it. That kind of calculus. Is essential to keep democracy going. The people around you, the no leader ever has any more um, and simple things to decide how to exercise them, they need to use certain power, do the things they want to do. Um, so, this is where professional norms, I think, are critical to keeping democracy um, So, I want to ask you all about a couple of cases and tell me if you think that this was a violation of professional norms or ethics. Yeah. And the first one is actually my own doc. He recently retired, I hope he did it I love this doctor. He uh, is uh, a very groovy doctor. I'm from Berkeley, as you know. So I was, uh, I, you know, I like that he would do normal medicine, but he would also do acupuncture and Chinese head treatments and things like this, and uh, all kinds of stuff, energy treatment. So, really, I think I, but it turns out he was a really conservative Republican. So much so that after one session of my daughter's never home to the back and the room, down the back. What are we talking about? Talk about politics, talk about whatever. Well, there's one time when he's treating me. This is back when Barack Obama was running against Mitt Romney. They stick in needles and be talking about how Mitt Romney's going to win. 
Violation or no? What do you mean? No. Yes. In the context of what you of your previous question. Yeah. Okay, Betty says no. And then I assume you're thinking because I regularly were talking about politics. He can do that right at the moment when he's sticking. I, I want to concentrate on the academic thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to concentrate on the study for the time of politics. That means Frank is not giving the rest of that. We have to give it a second. Okay. So I stick to your name. Uh, I'm gonna uh, so I thought that was violent. I felt I felt yes, if I'd given you consent here, you're supposed to be treating keep the politics out of the actual treatment. I invited I invited yeah. When you say keep the politics out of actual treatment, yeah. Okay, what Teachers are in a position of power, um, and I just think, especially for the children, I mean, these are emotional issues as well as intellectual issues, and I just think that's abusive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you disagree with that? It's interesting. The Chicago public schools don't allow this. Public schools have one of just don't allow it. Very elite private schools, whether it's in the workforce, it seems to happen much more often. And I guess my instinct is the same as yours. You, you know, if, now if it might be different if I have a I'm from the Dominican Republic and put a Dominican Republic flag. They're going to no one's going to be necessarily offended by it. But in this very heated moment, something which normally would be okay comes on. Free speech rights for sure. Everyone has free speech rights. The question is, you know, is it an appropriate use of their professional power? Yeah. Uh, I don't have any questions. Last time I about the about taking someone to high school or community college. But when we keep talking about politics, politics, or things like democracy as a, what it's meant to be, mm. theoretically, when we started having a presidency, a president or a politician wasn't like a leader. Anyone could be a politician or be in politics, anyone could be a president. So, how do you navigate that concept of like partisanship versus like right as a citizen to engage in? The democracy that we live in, and technically, yeah. politics shouldn't be a profession. Yeah. And it's found in the definition. Yeah, well, that's interesting. You know, back in the time of the ancient Greeks, uh, they had a system of political rotation. You know, it's random, all these male citizens would be allowed to come and govern really stuff. And many people want to get back to those kind of things where you have citizen of assembly. And you're right. It's a, um, so the question is does, that, does the professionalization of politics make it? Uh, yeah. Should I change our views? I think it makes it much, much more. You should take more effort to stay out of politics. And the reason is, well, as far as I ask, I really want to come. In my view, one of the reasons the American universities are in trouble is because we're seeing, rightly or wrongly, and I think wrongly in many cases, but we're seeing and being portrayed as just being about one side of the political. And um, there are practices that we engage in that we probably shouldn't, which would reduce that. 
And that might be the thrust of really what I'm trying to say. Like if we, we treat about, if we think of ourselves as professionally being professionals and having some internalized duty, we might do a little bit better than in, in the eyes of the public. I also think we have a much better story to tell in the eyes of the public, but not forget we're in this very media environment where truth is not, you know, will not always out as much. But, um, but I suppose the thrust of where I really want to go is I think a return to professional norms and ethics is what's going to happen. The only thing that's going to say is in an onslaught of legislation that's going to decide a lot of things we want. Now, this was a case I don't know much about, but I gather at UCSF during rounds of the protest, the Gaza protest, where uh, I, I, what I understood it was not in the hospital, but it was adjacent to the hospital, and it was clearly by, by the residents, by the people in the hospital, and such that it was, for the some interfering with the treatment of the in other words, they, they were hearing things which were by the residents needing more care. Are, there, are these medical residents? Yes, medical. It's not, not the residents of the city of San Francisco. Okay, the staff, the junior faculty, the residents of the hospital went out and were chanting, you know, shut it down for Gaza, you know, and such. What was being implied, whatever they were saying, but in direct proximity and knowing this uh, to the treatment place where patients were. You know, is that okay? I might have a fact wrong if then someone knows more. And again, everyone has free speech rights. There's not a legal problem. I'm not sure why it's not okay. So they're not they're not on duty. They're wearing their their costumes. Oh, they're wearing their <laughs> they're wearing their uh, surgical. They're, they're wearing their surgical uh, They're gone. So yeah, keep going, Lori. Look at me. I'm a public health professional. I'm a professional doctor. This is a violation of. Because they were more from the secretariat and they're threatened because they were under threat. So we have to do some 
I want to think about whether there's a difference between the situation in which um, the house staff at UCSF is demonstrating in their hospital attire immediately outside UCSF, where um, potential patients, people have to be in the hospital, potential people are into the hospital, will see that their doctors have this particular political view. As distinct from down, uh, a demonstration called the downtown San Francisco, where the very same people are part of a large mass of others, but they're still wearing scrubs and so forth, identifying themselves as healthcare professionals, and maybe as part of you know, not just a particular staff, but other facilities which are joining, so that they are not simply saying we are citizens, they are identifying themselves in a certain way, but not in such a way that their patients will almost inevitably be their physicians taking very particular position. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say that the one where they're conveying a message to their own patients is akin to your doctor on um, talking to you for treatment, and that's that problematic. Not at all clear that saying, under my guy, my identity is professional. I have a certain political theory. We just may get to your distinction of the other way I'm getting to work in this gravitation and strain. But it's one where you are not trying to communicate to your very to your very own patients that come to the side of what yeah. Well the thing about that context is it's in the cost category of doctors who got first of all, the scope of professional claim can be very broad indeed. And the, the, the professor was fired, the anthropologist who was fired uh, for Various tweets um, on the digital health thing. Made the claim that as an anthropologist, I'm an expert in power. And so I get to speak on this. You know, how power works. Well, that's a pretty expansive claim. You literally know anything to the professional expertise. Um, whereas the doctors who are protesting about government, as you said, right, we have a very specific thing that they want to just add to our doctors. And it does seem within the realm of professional competence, but we want to weigh that against the obvious cause and the more for professional application, the treatment of actual patients. So I really like getting to the treatment. And that's a good one. Yeah. Final patient getting treatment. I don't want to be hearing the same practice that you're in. Yeah. Oh. Um, exactly. Yeah, but what do we do? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, if you look at the large infections in between the south side of Chicago and downtown. And the radio was about 30 miles about square people. And uh, before we had a trauma center here, um, there are many of the training doctors who are constantly protesting, carrying black hats about racism and injustice, um, advocating for, you know, having a trauma center because of there's no access to a trauma center. I think that kind of expression is justified. Yeah. And we don't want to hear what they were saying. I'm sure there were patients who didn't like what they were saying, who didn't understand, or who didn't think it was racism. And that we feel their own opinion. Yeah. And if you don't yeah. want to hear what people are saying, then you can hear applause, but I think it's more than Well, yeah. I, 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 yeah, so I distinguish that it's that uh, yeah. that is that protest from the ones we had this spring. And the obvious distinction is what happened this spring is about a 120 year old war 6,000 miles away about which the University of Chicago didn't do absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. But the kids who really bravely started that protest because they live right, right across the street, you know, we're trying to effectuate a change in this institution. And I think that's really important because that's, you know, something it was. and. Obviously, I'm in the capacity of responding. Now, the patient, I agree, it would say maybe it goes to the degree of disruption. Some of the claims now that they shut down the whole universe, but actually, one of the claims in the anesthesiology terms is abolish the universe. But there's no causal logic which connects that to helping people in Gaza. 
whereas this one, there is a causal connection, so it might be way a little more. Well, in the protest, we're asking the university to the best. Yeah. To be able to yeah. So that's the offer. Yeah. Well, that's a causal there. connection, but yeah. Uh, well, I mean, far. It obviously many dominant people. That's true. But so what I guess my question is about that claim that the university is effectively speaking in its um endowment investment or yeah. what the investment is about. Yeah, okay. So I have a whole thing on uh you know why we should why I don't want Paul all of a sudden speaking to me about things. I'm you know, I'm not the guy, but you know, no, we didn't elect him to be a moral authority and tell us who's good that. So in general, I don't like it. Um, and I think the reason in a normal university context is that it squelches the inquiry. And it's particularly insidious on the question of the When you have that kind of state, pardon me, on this side of that institution. That puts junior faculty and graduate students are like, well, we're not doing part of the because we're part of the best of the time. I think it's pretty insidious. Now, the investment is a different thing. This, if we're investing in Coke or Pepsi, right, it's not, it doesn't affect my inquiry very much. Um, and so, uh, but you would want to claim, first of all, I think would be the burden would be to show that a divestment would actually make a difference. Lots of reasons to base it that out why it wouldn't. I myself, my take on why I don't support divestment or anything um, is that I actually value the technocratic knowledge of the people who are paid the I don't know anything about that. And I know that if we go down the route, like we're going to have a general faculty discussion about that, I'm going to be sitting in a meeting with Lori and Peggy all the time, arguing about this and that. And I want to do my work. So I think it's a distraction. Plus, by the way, it means lower salaries, higher tuition. If we really do it. So I, I just, but that's a pragmatic justification and not a high theoretical about inquiry. I just admit that, and I think we should talk about it and hope to do a faculty event on divestment this year for the faculty. Yeah, you've heard it. I have like a comment and questions like that everyone's talking about, like this perspective that we're taking of like how much of it overlaps with like professional expertise, how much of what you're saying in reflection of like um they have a doctor saying this versus they have like the decision of the like they being an expert in that group experience. In all of these discussions of like, oh, it would be okay in this situation but not this situation because it's impacting us directly versus not. In theory, wouldn't everything we say and do in a profession and not in our profession be applicable to how the United States functions as it interacts because we are a country of the people? And if the country of the people aren't attesting to what they believe the country should or shouldn't be doing, then it's no longer like citizens of the country being able to democratize or dictate what's going on in their opinion about those things, but rather now the three people who were elected because of the systems that's now deciding what is okay for us to talk about what not to talk about. Right. But here I think the role that you and I think is between your role as a citizen and your role as a professional is different. We as a people, as the people, do see that. We do go to the question when when should you go into your professional knowledge? When should you bring that advocacy into the professional sphere? And it's an argument for a narrow argument. But it's the assumption that, like, citizens will get a different professional knowledge. Are the scenarios in which you envision the people's role as a citizen not being fulfilled because they aren't? advocating in either direction or things like that. Because for example, all the positions here, all the residents here, etc. If you have your position role, you have your like citizen advocacy role, kind of what like we're advocating for. Um, if residents are working, physicians are working, at what point are they letting down the role of like an American citizen yeah, by not doing this? Is great so this is going to be partly responsive and you'll know, spend my last minute on this. So I have a friend who is a professor at two of the writers. October 8th last year, tweeted pretty horrific thing about Israelis and Jews and um, this professor um, who's a, a translator, actually, um, you know, he uh, was by and didn't contest it and uh, lost her job in that tweet. Uh, it's not very good tweet. And you know, I talked to a person and, uh, you know, 
Absolutely not an anti-Semite. You know, just just said why? Because there's an ethic out there, which I think which we should I think we should actually resist. That's not gonna like this. I don't believe that silence is always violence. If you don't know something about some conflict that's some six thousand miles away, you know it's okay to be quiet and learn. That's called epistemic humility. That's really important. And that's part of growing as a person and as a scholar. And so I think that sometimes we should be allowed to be quiet, to be reflecting, and to change our position. That's absolutely the same. I know it's hard. So I want to turn to one other one. I just heard the Scientific America, um, you know, which is a private magazine. They can do this, but they endorse Tom Lyons, right? Now, what do we think of that? Um, on the one hand, it is probably true, certainly scientific American maybe definite, that it doesn't mean that it was a better science on on the side um, than the Trump administration, though it's interesting that the core side of funding, and I wish I didn't take a huge hit in the Trump administration, it's more of a philosopher about it. But anyway, so they make the judgment it's better to have parents. Is that okay? Is that a good idea? Would you do that if you were running scientific American? Why not? Someone uh, has the vote. Yeah. Well, if a professional magazine making a judgment about what would be best for their profession and taking a strong stance based on that logic, I don't particularly see what would be at stake. And if readers of Science yeah. American like disagree, it. they can yeah. continue to read the magazine or not. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. That's clearly true. I guess my, yeah. Um, from an empirical perspective, actually, we've done some studies on how people perceive uh, sort of neutral scientific information uh, when these magazines take the um, It was a study that came out eight, nine months ago um, where a research group showed uh, nature's endorsement of Joe Biden in 2020, and then asked them to raise the question about what they thought of nature's research, either totally non political, whether it's on, you know, hot and hot or whatever for this. Um, and they showed pretty convincingly that trust among Republicans substantially declined after they became aware of it. Um, what are considered neutral epistemic positions, um, both political positions, regardless of whether they thought that they had the better of science to hold um, or whatever. And that's my concern, you know, and it gets back to the fact that if you're not with it, people in universities may not, you know, I don't know, yeah, you think of God in rural Iowa or something. I worry that whoever it is is going to come up with a critical answer is, you know, a Republican kid in Iowa who might never come to the university if they think that we're not as good. And that's why I, mean, I think I want to just refer to this point that I'm totally happy to discuss it. Uh, uh, that, um, you know, there is virtue. In these professional norms, especially in times as polarizing as ours, if we don't do that, if we don't get back to that, universities sure are in major danger. And I believe in other professions too, and that they have on space as well. Anyway, yeah. 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 I know some people have to leave, yeah. uh, but we have time for questions. And I think um, particularly we have a fellow to stay after a meet with Tom, but there's going to be a lot of discussion, so I think it's probably okay. And if anyone would like to stay, uh, they can, but we always have time for questions anyway. Oh, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, um, that why are the class attendance 